I'm Frank Tomasello of the Institute's Griffith Foundation, alongside Tom Considine of NCOIL. Our organizations enjoy a long-standing collaborative relationship. It's a pleasure to come together with Tom to present this nonpartisan and non-advocative primer program on the fundamentals of risk management and insurance. The session is offered for the benefit of both newly elected officials and those who desire a refresher, and it's a great way to revisit foundational concepts in advance of the forthcoming spring meeting of NCOIL. In the moments ahead, I'll introduce our presenter, a learned professor of insurance and finance. But first, let me call upon Tom Consonine to share a few words. Tom? Well, thanks, Frank. It's great to see you. And it's, it's an even greater pleasure to welcome all our guests on today's uh, web broadcast. It's been just a wonderful experience for me and, frankly, for all of NCOIL to work so closely with the Institute's Griffith Foundation over the year and, and frankly, over the decades now. Um, it's this session we think is going to be exceptionally useful for legislators, uh, both to learn about NCOIL, to learn about insurance regulation, and to prepare uh, for those coming to our first meeting of the year, our spring meeting. But even if you can't make the spring meeting, this session is going to be useful about insurance regulation. Our spring meeting is in San Diego, not a miserable place to go in the month of March, from March 9th to the 12th. And we really would love to see you there. You can register for it at our website, ncoil.org. We'll be covering a plethora of important and timely insurance issues, including we'll be kicking off our year-long special series on ESG, environmental, social, and governance issues, and how they relate to the insurance world. There'll be a model bill discussed on transparency in PNC insurance underwriting, and also, we'll begin discussion of a model bill which seeks to bring the principles underlying medical loss ratio to dental insurance. So it's really a dental loss ratio bill. Of course, there'll be other topics, but I don't want to delay today's session with going through them in any greater detail than that. So we look forward to a great webinar today and a great meeting out in San Diego in March. That's all I have for now, Frank. So with that and my pleasure, I'd like to turn it back to you. Thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure now to introduce Dr. David T. Russell, Professor of Insurance and Finance at California State University, Northridge. Dr. Russell earned a PhD in Risk Management and Insurance from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School and an AB in Economics from Amherst College. He joined California State University, Northridge in 2002 after teaching at the Katy School of Insurance at Illinois State University. To learn more about his background and interests, we invite you to visit csnu.edu slash finance. David, thank you for sharing your insights and expertise with our audience of public policymakers. The floor is yours. Thanks, Frank. It's a pleasure to be here. And on behalf of the Griffith Foundation, I want to thank you for your time and the collaboration that Tom Considine and Incoil have with the Griffith Foundation in helping insurance legislators understand the dynamics of the insurance product, the insurance market, risk management, and how to think about uh, potential legislative ideas. I'm David Russell. I'm director of the Center for Risk Management and Insurance at California State University at Northridge, which is in the greater Los Angeles area. I've been all over the country. Uh, I grew up in Kentucky. I went to graduate school in Philadelphia, lived in Illinois, and now I'm in California, so I'd like to think I have a good perspective on issues across the country. So as you may know, the Griffith Foundation is a nonpartisan, non-advocative educational organization designed to help you and other insurance legislators understand the insurance mechanism and how better to um, form opinions and ultimately make policy. I will not advocate for any particular position. Uh, I can't help but um, give my own perspective, but I want you to understand that any policymaking uh, decisions are, of course, yours, and I do not want to bias you in any way. So today's comments are uh, an overview of a multi-trillion dollar industry here in the U.S. It will be... Um, high level, conceptual, and any detail and nuance are left for you to discover on your own 
and perhaps to uh, get more information at the NCOIL National Meeting, the annual meeting uh, later in March. Two great resources for getting up to speed on insurance um, data, insurance concepts, hot topics, and further uh, training videos, you can visit the Insurance Information Institute or III at iii.org. And you can also uh, visit the Griffith Foundation's website, which has archived on-demand seminar content on a variety of hot topics so that you can better understand some of the dynamics that are going on in the marketplace. So first, let's talk about the important role that insurance has in um, the citizens of the United States, the, the lives of uh, families and uh, individuals across the US. Um, really, we're, we're talking about protecting people's health, people's financial well-being, and in many cases, their most important assets, such as their home or their retirement savings. So many times insurance is not only desirable, it's required by the government to demonstrate financial responsibility. For example, most uh, states require that drivers demonstrate, demonstrate financial responsibility by uh, having at least a certain amount of automobile liability insurance. Those uh, minimum limits vary by state. But most states uh, insist that you demonstrate that financial responsibility, and insurance is the best way to do that. Virtually all states also require that employers protect their workers by purchasing workers' compensation insurance. Very few employers uh, opt out or find uh, some other mechanism, and, and instead they buy workers' comp insurance. So auto and workers' comp are arguably required. It's also required by lenders. Uh, your, your mortgage lender requires insurance to protect the collateral uh, underlying the mortgage. Uh, an automobile lender also requires uh, insurance to protect the vehicle in case it's damaged or stolen. And other counterparties uh, to any contract, a landlord may require a certain amount of liability insurance. Um, anytime you engage a vendor, the, Vendors want to be held harmless or named as additional insureds or vice versa. The, the contracting party requires the vendor to, to prove that they're insured and have a certain amount of uh, insurance coverage through what's called an insurance certificate. This provides people with comfort that anything that goes wrong will have at least some uh, financial um, wherewithal to cover um, most, most um, unfortunate events. In other cases, uh, insurance provides uh, a foundation for the activity uh, at all. So many, many corporations and explorations, R&D would not be available uh, unless there was the prospect that insurance coverage would take over and protect businesses against accidents, um, theft, um, or the unknown. So insurance provides a, a runway for most businesses and individuals to undertake activities they may otherwise deem too risky. So what is insurance? Insurance is a contract and it pays for an insured's covered losses. We'll talk a little later about some of the, the what causes these losses. Not all uh, losses are covered by insurance. But that's the main reason. It's a promise to pay under certain conditions. And this provides the parties we referenced on the previous slide, the insured and other people surrounding it, victims, uh, banks, um, contract counterparties with the comfort that there's um, financial resources available. This also allows people to proceed in the face of uncertainty this allows a more effective and efficient use of resources across all economic participants. It also may encourage loss prevention. For example, you may be required by your insurer to update your wiring or to um, use certain safety devices uh, that uh, otherwise you would not be able to get insurance. So 
deductibles allow the sharing of risk with insured. So deductibles and these insurance requirements actually will encourage people to protect themselves because the insurer requires it. And these protection mechanisms will allow the protection of both the insured and the insurer. So let's talk about a few foundational insurance terms. You um, will get up to speed very quickly with these four terms uh, when you're speaking with insurance industry or insurance uh, legislators. So loss frequency is how, how often something ha uh, happens. Some people would c you call this probability. So um, generally, most insurance contracts do not experience a loss. I haven't had an automobile loss, knock on wood, for many, many years. Um, so there are other people that have frequent losses, but loss frequency is something that varies with time, with economic activity, with the climate, et cetera. During the pandemic, loss frequency in automobile insurance fell quite a bit because people were not driving as much. On the other side, you have loss severity. When a loss does happen, how bad is it? So loss severity during the pandemic in automobile insurance went way up because the few people that were on the, on the road were driving much faster. And as a result, their accidents were much more severe. Uh, another um, factor in loss severity is uh, inflation. So because automobiles have become more sophisticated, bumpers are more expensive to fix now. Um, and because we are returning to normal, um, there are more people on the road. They might be going slower, but because of inflation, the repairs are more costly. Perils are causes of loss, examples being fire, wind, theft, or an automobile collision. You might also have a lawsuit or an accident of some kind. These are what actually cause the financial loss. And <clears throat> not all perils are covered by all insurance contracts. There are what are called exclusions. So homeowners generally will, will cover fire, wind, and theft, but it won't cover flood and earthquake. Those must be added as separate coverages, um, usually um, in most states, either through an additional premium or the purchase of a separate policy. So hazards are uh, conditions that increase the frequency and or severity of loss. For example, if you store flammable materials in your garage, that doesn't cause the loss. Fire causes losses. But the, the presence of those materials would increase the frequency or severity of a fire. Moral hazard is a unique uh, expression in economics and insurance that says that with the presence of insurance, um, policyholders are more likely to be dishonest because a third party is going to pay money for something, a new item, a, um, uh, you not you might be able to stage an accident, et cetera. So most claims by far are, are legitimate, but people do <clears throat> either become dishonest in the presence of insurance or they can become careless. And we call that morale hazard. So the fact that you have insurance might make you a little more careless than you otherwise would be if you were on the hook for all of the loss. Having the insurance company pay for it gives you financial comfort and that comfort can lead to higher frequency or severity of losses. So as I've mentioned before, not all losses are insurable. So insurance covers pure risks and pure risks are those that the best thing that can happen is no loss. So the best thing that can happen to your house is it does not burn down. Alternatively, it can burn down. So the best thing that can happen is no loss. The worst thing that can happen is a total loss. Examples would be the cost of a lawsuit, uh, fire losses, as I mentioned, or water damage. Speculative risks, on the other hand, not covered by insurance, include the opportunity for a profit. So speculative risks like buying a stock, um, the market value of your house rather than its physical condition, 
um, a business idea that can succeed and you make money or it can fail and you lose money. Insurance does not cover speculative risks because people would take additional risk in the presence of insurance coverage. And um, I would buy insurance and heads I win if my stock goes up, tails I lose, I simply file an insurance claim. So to align the interests of individuals, insurance does not co cover speculative risks and for several other reasons. Let me give you an example of, a, of an insurance policy that actually covers pure risk. The same policy covers pure risks, but does not cover speculative risks. Something called business income insurance, it used to be known as business interruption, and we've ser certainly seen a lot of news stories about business income insurance during the pandemic. Um, business income insurance does not cover um, losses due to viruses or when there's no physical damage. And so that's been litigated through the courts. And so far the courts have been pretty steadfast that business income insurance does not cover losses from the pandemic with very few exceptions. For example, a business income insurance policy um, does not cover um, uh, low volumes due to a recession. So we may or may not be going into recession and if business slows down, your business income insurance policy would not pay for that. However, if your business were closed due to a fire, um, you would be covered. So one of the reasons it doesn't cover business volumes um, from economic conditions is economic conditions can improve and you can make more money. So uh, business volumes are uh, part of the business environment, which is a speculative risk. Other risks are difficult to insure for the insurance industry, such as earthquake, flood, and hurricane. These are very large risks, can affect many policies at the same time, and the risk spreading mechanism that we'll talk about in a little while can break down. If everybody needs help at the same time, the insurance company could be overwhelmed. They, they do cover certain aspects of these, you know, hurricane coverage is covered uh, as a wind damage coverage and in certain cases water damage, but the flooding element is not covered. And many states and insurance companies allow for hurricane deductibles that increase the um, insured's burden if, if the wind blows above a certain point. So insurers use something called reinsurance, which is insurance for insurance companies, a way for insurers to lay off part of their risk on another insurance company. And as I mentioned, they might use higher deductibles and exclusions to avoid making promises that they can't keep. Here in California, as we've seen the events in Turkey, um, California very much has a seismic exposure that if the big one hits, the insurance companies sim simply aren't gonna be able to pay. And rather than make a promise they can't honor, they simply say, we can't pay for that. In many cases, government programs um, are initiated to offer insurance coverage or assist. In the case of California, as I mentioned, um, there is a separate insurance company created by the state legislature in 1996. Um, the California Earthquake Authority was created in response to a market breakdown following the 1994 uh, Northridge earthquake. In Florida, they created citizens' property insurance to, to cover, um, you know, beachfront wind uh, coverage when that market was under stress. Other perils are simply excluded for public policy reasons, such as illegal activity. Um, if you get a speeding ticket, your auto insurance will not pay for that. If it did, uh, there the, you know, punitive and and um, deterrence value of a ticket would lose its, uh, its value and insurance would be encouraging illegal activity. In other cases, um, the, the losses might be intentional. You would intentionally um, cause a loss uh, in order to get a new item or because you're angry or something, and that is also not covered. So intentional losses you'll find as an exclusion in virtually every policy. In other cases, the risk may be insurable, but dif difficult to value. Uh, and so 
insurance companies, rather than getting into a debate with their policyholder about what an item might be worth, they simply don't cover it or place what's called a sublimit on it. So virtually all homeowners policies don't cover pets. We'll talk briefly about pet insurance later, but pets are not covered because they're difficult to value and it creates, in certain cases, uh, un unseemly uh, incentives for certain people. In other cases, you might have something that's difficult to prove, such as cash. So I think most of us have cash in our wallet, although cash is becoming somewhat obsolete in today's world. But there's $200 of cash coverage in your homeowner's policy. If you have large amounts of cash at home, um, then it's not protected by insurance because um, it would give rise to the incentives to um, misrepresent how much cash you have on hand in the event that there were a, a total loss. And it's basically impossible to prove with, with the exception of certain uh, forensic techniques. So risk management is a, a, a way to manage um, financial uncertainty. And there are several tools in that toolbox. Insurance is only one of, of, of several. So there's two main categories. There's risk control, which is attempting to reduce the frequency and severity. So using um, alarms or, or security systems or uh, security guards to protect a property. Um, it doesn't make sure, it doesn't prevent with certainty a, a, a theft loss, but it probably reduces the frequency and severity of that. There are other cases where loss mitigation might improve. You might use um, bracing to secure a property against earthquake damage or move it away from bodies of water to mitigate the losses. Avoidance would, would be not doing that activity at all. For example, the city may declare that no one can build in the 50-year floodplain that way um, we're not constantly rescuing people who would be in harm's way. Now, if a loss happens, how do we pay for it? That's what risk financing is. And as uh, most of this uh, webinar will be about the insurance tool, and that is taking your risk and for a fixed fee that we call a premium, transferring it to an insurance company, which is also a pooling mechanism. So if you use Allstate, you pay them a premium, and if there are no losses, they keep the premium. And if, but if you do have a loss that's covered, then you uh, are indemnified with a claim payment. Retention means to keep the risk. So here in California, many people don't buy earthquake insurance. So if, the, if they have earthquake damage, they'll have to pursue of financing their losses in some other way since the insurance company will not be there. Many of us have deductibles as part of our homeowners or automobile insurance and retention means that the deductible part we're keeping and the rest we're transferring to the insurance company. Finally, one other tool is a non-insurance transfer. This means to use hold harmless clauses or you will indemnify me in case something or management is not respons responsible for losses, et cetera. So the non-insurance transfer tool is often used in contracts to uh, push the risk off on a contract counterparty. So today we're, we're setting all of you up for success in thinking about insurance regulation. Um, Virtually all citizens need or, or are insured in some way by one or more insurance policies. And because most citizens don't understand a lot about insurance, insurance is in need of regulation to protect those consumers and policyholders. Another thing that most people don't think about is what if their insurance company is unable to pay? So one, uh, one objective of insurance regulation is to make sure that insurance companies have the resources to meet all of their uh, claims payment obligations, because without the certainty that they can pay, the, the effectiveness of the insurance promise loses its um, comfort uh, pro providing dimensions. Um, 
Another aspect of insurance regulation is to prevent destructive competition. So over the last several decades, you've seen airlines compete with each other until they end up go, going bankrupt. The same can happen in insurance because you get paid up front as an insurance company for, for uh, a loss that may or may not happen in the future. There is a uh, motivation to sell insurance. And one of the ways you sell more insurance is to cut the price. And if you cut the price too much, it can result in promises that you're unable to meet. So with all of these things in mind, regulators need to protect the consumers and to some degree protect consumers from uh, insurers damaging themselves. So this again is a, 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 a sliver of what regulators do, but <clears throat> regulators read the insurance policies that most consumers do not, and they pr protect consumers in, in terms of making sure those contracts are reasonable, they're clear, they're relatively unambiguous, and make sure that they conform to state law. So because consumers are either unwilling or unable to read the policies, um, regulators sort of step in to help with that. They also observe, regulate, and investigate market conduct. Market conduct it, it ranges from unfair or unreasonable uh, sales practices, deceptive sales practices, unfair claim settlement, um, charging people an inappropriate or unfair premium. And um, market conduct exams happen routinely, sometimes uh, on a surprise basis, but this, this helps uh, regulators oversee and correct the the, the mistakes and, and bad actors in the marketplace. Um, one thing that uh, many people don't understand is that insurance coverage is not always available. Because there's so many ads on TV, everyone assumes that you can buy as much insurance as you want whenever you want. That's not always true. In certain cases, because of market conditions or because a coverage is difficult to provide, Insurers don't offer it. Um, one of the things we'll, we'll hear about later is insurance in certain urban areas where the claims activity may be high, a regulator stepped in over the last several decades and created insurance mechanisms for difficult to insure areas. So the same is true of beachfront property in Florida, and as I mentioned, earthquake here in California. If you left it to the marketplace, the insurance would be very limited in its availability and perhaps very expensive. So regulators can help the marketplace heal or provide coverage that's needed. Finally, um, one, of the, one of the aspects to any insurance transaction, of course, is the price. So the premiums are um, oftentimes regulated. Sometimes they're left to market conditions, but in either event, uh, regulators want to make sure that a homeowner or an, uh, or an automobile uh, um, driver needs that needs coverage can get it at least on some reasonable basis. Otherwise, if it's not affordable, it's simply the same thing as being unavailable. So as a reminder, uh, as, um, as a result of several Supreme Court um, decisions in the U.S. in the 1800s and early 1900s, insurance is regulated at the state level. Congress in 1945 delegated its, um, its right to, uh, to regulate insurance to the states. So the McCarran-Ferguson Act allowed the states to continue regulating insurance as they had done for so long. And the states depend on organizations like NCOIL and the NAIC, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, to provide guidance and model laws that they can adopt, since most states don't have the critical mass to develop extremely uh, detailed regulation. They can depend on these non-governmental organizations to give guidance. And then if they need to make an adjustment for political reasons or because of the 
the special economic needs of a state, they can adjust those model laws or adopt their own. So the federal government does not generally get involved in the insurance market with a few exceptions. As I mentioned, flood is difficult to insure because it affects many policyholders at the same time. So FEMA created the National Flood Insurance Program, which allows insurers to offer uh, coverage against flood that's sort of reinsured by FEMA. The Federal Insurance Office, which was um, created by Dodd-Frank, is largely a data collection organization. I've used their data and it's really good. And finally, after the September 11th attacks, Congress created the terrorism risk insurance uh, pool that allows um, property insurers and, and others to access reinsurance from the U.S. Treasury in the event of a terrorist attack. So insurance is based on a mathematical principle called the law of large numbers. It allows everyone to, to enter a pool, and this pooling uh, allows uh, a policyholder, say me, to get rid of my individual risk and instead take a small part of a large pool, which is much more predictable on an average loss per policy basis. My losses may fluctuate wildly, but the bigger the pool, the actual results per policy for the pool are quite predictable. So scale is important to achieving this uh, risk reduction, risk reducing the mathematical um, uh, principle of the law of large numbers. And so it allows uh, an insurer to take the losses of a few and spread the cost over many. However, if we all have a loss at the same time, as I've mentioned multiple times, if everyone is suffering a loss at the same time, pooling really doesn't help very much. So when the risks are correlated, the pool can break down, and this makes it very difficult for insurers to cover. Not impossible. There are, there are ways using reinsurance or government facilities, but it becomes much more difficult than individual losses. So how do insurance companies achieve uh, a price? So actuaries who are mathematically gifted um, personnel that use um, prior loss data, use that data, use some averages, some trending techniques, and make a forecast of what the insurance company's uh, losses, expenses, and profit needs are to arrive at a premium. In my example on the slide here, imagine we have, we insured 10,000 Ford Mes Mustangs last year, and we lost $10 million from that pool of, of 10,000 Mustangs. On average, that's $1,000 per Mustang. And we will add commission expense, overhead, some inflation, and, a, and, and some amount of profit to calculate a premium to, for this coming year, because Last year it was 10 million, but with inflation it might be more. And so we would charge this in a competitive marketplace. However, our forecast may prove to be overly optimistic or overly pessimistic. The, insurer, the insurers will earn a profit in good years and lose money in bad years. And in bad years, if they lose money, it's the owners that uh, bear that loss and they put up capital to, to back the promises and on average, they need to be able to earn a profit. Um, otherwise, the capital won't be present to meet the promises in those bad years. So profitability is something that regulators need to watch. They don't want it to be too profitable. And the, the terminology in most insurance codes is adequate, meaning enough to provide a reasonable return and cover all costs, not excessive, meaning we don't want the insurer to get rich on this, and finally, not unfairly discriminatory, meaning it doesn't violate any um, uh, uh, you know, ethical codes or uh, um, you know, protected groups that might otherwise be discriminated against through the insurance pricing mechanism. Some of the other factors that affect insurance pricing might be, uh, as I mentioned, inflation. So the cost of body shops, parts, and labor 
all of these things can drive up costs. Um, there was a surge in lumber during the pandemic, and now it's come way back down. So these fluctuating costs make it difficult to forecast what losses will be. Other times, parts uh, may take a very long time. I know a, a, a number of friends of mine who've had uh, rental cars for, for weeks, if not months, because the parts that their car needed were still waiting, uh, were still somewhere on a ship. Uh, and so supply chain chal challenges can contribute to claims. So here in the US, property catastrophe reinsurance has gone uh, up in price significantly. And because insurers are paying more to transfer some of their catastrophe risk to a reinsurer, they're going to end up passing some of that along to their policyholders in, you know, in the next uh, rate cycle. Um, interest rates are uh, something that we're, we've seen go up significantly recently as the result of the monetary policy. This can actually help with insurance pricing because insurers earn money on their, on their funds awaiting payout, and we'll talk about that a little later. Social inflation or legal system abuse, where juries or um, gamesmanship of the legal system uh, through plaintiffs and class action lawsuits, this can increase costs for everyone through the insurance pricing mechanism since the insurer needs to recover these costs. And finally, insurance fraud. If you have an uptick in insurance fraud, insurers have to pass the cost of that along through the insurance um, pricing mechanism. So how do insurers make money? They make a forecast and on average they will achieve their goals if, they're, if their expectations are, are met on claims, expenses, um, profitability, and uh, revenue. As I mentioned, they invest the money in mostly in interest-bearing instruments, but also in, in stocks and alternative investments. And so this contributes to revenue. And while insurance uh, company profit margins are actually quite low because of competition here in the US, uh, they still can make money uh, through the in investment mechanism, if nothing else. But if uh, the stock market goes down or if claims turn out to be higher than expected, as, as we've seen with a lot of auto insurers recently, then insurers can lose money. So what do insurers put the money in? Well, they hold pretty much a, a few asset classes. They hold a certain amount of cash to be able to pay their expenses and claims in the short run. They also invest money in, in government bonds and corporate bonds, usually of higher quality to provide safety, but some return. They also put some component of their money in, in stocks that allows for uh, invest, investment returns uh, on a uh, longer term basis. And then they might own some real estate, mortgage backed securities, um, you know, alternative investments of a variety of kinds. But regulators and rating agencies are monitoring these assets to make sure that the insurer doesn't load up on risky activities and put their claims paying ability at risk. It's uh, noted that many insurance companies um, who suffer financial distress and, and they are this number is fairly rare but many of those insolvencies actually come from poor investment choices rather than claims so what are the major lines of insurance well they're the ones you normally would think of and that would be automobile homeowners life insurance health insurance dental and vision or smaller lines of insurance uh, there are certain liability types such as umbrella um, commercial insurance for businesses, such as commercial multiple peril, sometimes called business owners, um, workers' compensation, general liability, commercial property, um, professional liability, sometimes called malpractice or errors and omissions, commercial auto, business income, marine insurance, and, and many others. Some of the lesser known lines of insurance are annuities, which are sold by life insurance companies, a marine insurance for goods in transit, cyber liability to pr protect data and hacking uh, liabilities, title insurance, which is part of the real estate transaction in case there's a title defect. There is a property coverage 
<clears throat> called difference in conditions that provides for coverage gaps uh, when uh, there are certain perils that are excluded. Long-term care is a type of insurance. Um, there are some niche products. I mentioned pet insurance earlier. This is a high growth area because people are investing in their animals in, in a way that they didn't previously. And this is, can cover largely health expenditures for your pet. And then there's something called longevity insurance, which is kind of uh, a, a type of annuity product that pays if you, if you live beyond a certain date. Insurance is sold in the, normally in the admitted market, but there's also something called the non-admitted market. The admitted market is served by insurers who are licensed in that particular state. However, in some states, um, you also have uh, uh, players that are selling insurance when the admitted market is not serving the interests of the policyholders at a particular price or perhaps at any price. Here in California, we have wildfire problems where many of the admitted insurers are non-renewing people because at the price that the regulators want to uh, allow you to charge is insufficient. So homeowners need to enter the, the excess and surplus lines market, which is the non-admitted market. Lloyd's of London is a non-admitted market. It's not that it's uh, you know the gray market, it's simply an alternative market when the admitted market is unable to serve policyholders for a particular risk. Agents and brokers normally are required to get several decline, declinations from admitted carriers before they pursue coverage in the non-admitted market. Insurers are owned by a, a, a variety of ownership uh, entities or structures. So uh, the three forms of ownership are stock companies, mutual companies, and reciprocal insurance exchanges. So there are others, but these stocks and mutuals really dominate the organizational form of insurance companies. So stock companies are owned by um, insurance um, uh, stockholders. So Allstate is a stock company. Um, uh, Progressive is a stock company. Mutual companies are owned by their policyholders. You can think of it like a co-op or a credit union. S a State Farm Mutual Automobile is a uh, mutual company. Liberty Mutual is uh, a mutual company. Um, uh, Northwestern Mutual is a mutual company, again, owned by its policyholders. A reciprocal uh, exchange is a, a company that is run by an attorney in fact, um, that might be owned by an external organization. Farmers insurance is a reciprocal exchange where the policyholders participate in sort of mini mutuals and it's overseen by an attorney in fact organization. Um, that's owned by Zurich Insurance in, in Switzerland. So how is insurance distributed? Insurance is normally distributed either by exclusive agents that re represent one company, State Farm and Allstate have this arrangement that when you go to a State Farm agent, they only sell State Farm insurance. Independent agents, however, represent many companies. They have appointments with between two and 15 uh, insurance companies, and they can get you the best price from any one of those. Brokers represent insurance buyers rather than sellers. This is typically used by commercial agents. You hear that GEICO uses direct, so you contact um, uh, GEICO directly either through their website or through an 800 number. That's a direct channel. And then there are other companies that use um, multiple channels, and we call this an omni-channel model. Underwriting is the process of selecting and classifying which insurance applicants an insurer will choose to insure. They don't want to turn you down, but they want to make sure that um, you fit as an applicant within their uh, risk appetite and pricing goals. It's similar to how a bank might uh, choose to lend money. They use algorithms, human judgment, um, loss history and credit profile in many states, there is an insurance score that's like a FICO score that uh, provides information about your 
propensity to file claims. They might use physical inspections. They might use satellite imagery. However, in some jurisdictions, regulations don't allow certain um, underwriting techniques. So this is left to insurance codes and, and, and regulators. The claims department is the part of the insurance company that meets the promise. They settle the claims. Many people call these claims adjusters. Oftentimes insurers call them claims representative. They evaluate the claim for validity, that it meets the conditions of the policy, and they disburse the funds. State regulators will randomly audit claims files and make sure that consumers are getting all that they're owed. They also want to make sure that insurers are not overpaying because if they're overpaying, that means uh, premiums will ultimately be too high. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, insurance fraud can contribute to higher than expected claims and also flow through to premiums. So insurance regulators want to be sure that insurers are uh, investigating insurance fraud appropriately. Some other information you might want to, to, to know, um, the primary rating agency for insurance companies is AM Best. And an AM Best rating of A minus or better is critical to most insurers to be able to access the customers who have such a need. Many banks won't lend uh, unless you have insurance from an A minus or better rated carrier. As I mentioned, reinsurance is insurance for insurance companies, and this is one way that insurance companies are able to take big risks or, um, you know, concentrated risks. Uh, this is a way that they take on those risks and then spread it out to other insurance companies. Many insurance companies evaluate their accumulation of risk using something called a CAT model or catastrophe model as a, a computer simulation to see how much they might lose from a particular event. And finally, uh, you know, equity markets and bond markets can affect how an insurance company's rates and financial condition go since uh, investment is an important part of their revenue and a part of their ability to pay. Government oftentimes intervenes in insurance markets, as I mentioned, um, when the private market is unable to pay. If the FAIR plan is present in most states to make sure that people who need insurance are able to get it. What if an insurance company is unable to pay? Well, there's something called a state guarantee fund. It's somewhat like the FDIC, but it's at the state level and it's for insurance. So within limits, uh, a, a, a policyholder can get paid in, in the event that their uh, insurance company is unable to meet its obligation. As I mentioned earlier, catastrophe facilities like Citizens, the California Earthquake Authority, some states have beach and wind pools to help protect against catastrophic risks. And then some states actually run their own state workers' compensation insurance plan, either to, to compete with the insurance, um, uh, the private market, or to replace it completely. What are some comp you know, current issues? Uh, as I mentioned, auto inflation has really spiked. And so many in auto insurers, despite raising rates significantly, they're still losing money. Some of the, um, the stress in homeowners markets is a result of perceived climate change and increased weather volatility that has resulted in additional hailstorms, uh, hurricanes and other uh, events. Some markets are having trouble getting insurance until uh, insurers become comfortable that claims are um, stabilizing and they're able to collect an appropriate rate. And then finally, technology has enabled insurers to, to perhaps get closer to what they want to charge. Many um, data collection devices such as progressive snapshot or somehow being able to plug into a car's GPS system um, we call that either telematics or usage-based insurance where you charge by the mile. Finally, there's some controversy around insurance scores based on credit bureau data. It's not income, but it is. there is some indication that claims um, uh, activity um, is highly correlated with how you manage your credit. And because of this, um, insurers can use that electronically and very efficiently. So I wanna thank you for your public service and on behalf of the Griffith Foundation, 
uh, for the time you've t- taken to, to listen to, to me and uh, for your participation in NCOIL. And I would encourage you to access our content at griffithfoundation.org, as well as to consider attending the annual meeting in March. Good day. This program is a collaborative presentation of the Institute's Griffith Insurance Education Foundation and the National Council of Insurance Legislators. In keeping with the mission of the Institute's Griffith Foundation, this program is strictly instructional in nature and does not support a position on any issues.